All right, nice. We started the recording. Bruno, you want to do some uh, introductory comments, and I'll follow up with that and begin our, our our meeting. Nice. Okay, I'll do it first in Portuguese, then I say some words in English for everybody that's with us here. Bom, pessoal, meu bom dia aí para todos vocês. Agora aí são 10 horinhas da manhã aí no Brasil, então, como eu tenho aí uma grande uma grande parcela de, de colegas aí de nacionalidade aqui, eu vou começar abrindo em português, então sejam muito bem-vindos. É um grande privilégio contar com a presença aqui de vocês nesse, nesse sábado de manhã, tá? Para a gente participar desse bate-papo. É um bate-papo bastante, bastante tranquilo, realmente, para a gente agregar conhecimento, trocar ideias com uma pessoa muito importante, muito especial, que é o cara aí que foi pioneiro na identificação aí do, da, do componente de liderança, né? Perdão. Do componente de liderança para o sucesso do Lean e do Kaizen. Que é o Bob Emiliani, que pegou aí, foi pioneiro nesse assunto aí a partir dos anos, dos anos 90, foi treinado pela Shinjutsu, que foi a consultoria aí autorizada pelo Taichi Ono, teve contato com, com o Sensei, com, com o Nakausa, que trabalhou junto com o Taichi Ono. Então, um cara que entende muito aí, com muitas décadas, tanto de prática em campo, na indústria, quanto também aí décadas aí na, no mundo acadêmico produzindo conteúdo. Então, decidimos aí nos juntar por ideia dele para fazer essa sequência de três bate-papos e hoje o nosso primeiro bate-papo aí vai ser um, uma visão geral né, do que o Lean era em 88, do que o Lean se tornou hoje e vamos conversar também sobre o que provavelmente vai acontecer com o Lean no futuro, certo? É, nosso bate-papo vai ser principalmente em inglês, mas eu vou fazer os comentários aqui com vocês em português também, e depois as gravações, <risos> perdão, as gravações a gente vai ter a legenda aí completa em português para vocês poderem revisar, ok? So, uh, I would like to welcome everybody to our, to our little, little talk. Uh, I was first introducing how we would work to my fellow Brazilian folks. So, it's really a great pleasure to be, to be here with you, and alongside with Bob. So we can talk a little bit about uh, the present situation, the past situation, and the future situation of, of Lean. Uh, I'll let Bob introduce himself because he knows his history better than I do. But I just want to say that I'm a, a very big fan. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks uh, everybody uh, for joining us. Um, uh, let me just say at the outset, we invite your participation. So raise your hand if you have a comment or question or put a comment or question in the chat if you prefer that. As you know, this meeting is recorded. I'll post it on my YouTube channel and uh, Bruno will do the same and uh, he will have uh, Portuguese uh, subtitles when it's posted on the YouTube, on his YouTube channel. Um, so today, um, let's see, cancel that. I have a notification that I need to cancel. Um, so yes, today we're going to talk about uh, you know lean in the past, lean in the present, lean in the future. And so let me begin by just um, uh, talking a bit about the past. Now, uh, in the in the past, uh, our lean became known as a term to all in 1988 with the publication of John Krafchick's uh, paper in Sloan Management Review: The Triumph of the Lean Production System. And uh, this research that was done at MIT starting in the early 1980s called the International Motor Vehicle Program uh, was a study funded by the US government. It was quite a, a big study. It was uh, funded with $5 million, which was a lot of money back then. And the US government wanted to understand why Japanese companies were so much more competitive than US companies. And so of course the MIT folks did a detailed study of uh, essentially The, the production aspects, the productivity and quality and so forth. Um, so that study and the subsequent uh, launching of the term lean uh, as a, uh, back then, meant to be a generic term for Toyota production system, this was all a very well-intentioned effort to bring TPS uh, to the masses. But it is, of course, a Western and uh, a British Uh, yeah, excuse me, a Western American British uh, interpretation of Toyota production system by the principal folks that were involved in the study, which was uh, Jim Womack and Dan Jones. Um, 
There was, of course, prior work done by uh, people such as Richard Schoenberger, uh, Ken Wantok, um, Yasuhiro Manden, which uh, talked a great deal about Japanese manufacturing and, uh, and even respect for humanity, uh, respect for people and so forth. But their works were uh, lesser known and didn't gain the uh, wide following that uh, the, the work that the MIT folks uh, produced. And of course, Womack and Jones were, you know, principals in that study, but there was many, many others that were involved with that. So it it the, it woke. So the the term lean and the the MIT study woke people up to a wonderful a new form of progressive management that has, of course, great potential to improve not just management but the leadership of uh, businesses. And today we understand it to be uh, uh, applicable to any organization, not just manufacturing. Um, so it started as lean production and, uh, and from that, that start, you know, it always missed critically important aspects, of Toyota production system. Uh, and because it, there's things that are lost in translation and it's just something that's difficult to understand. And it takes a lot of time to, uh, really, uh, understand Toyota production system, which as Ono said in his a book that was written in Japanese uh, in Japanese in 1978 and translated to English in 1988, the Toyota Production System book that he wrote. Uh, he said it's not just a, a, a you know a production system; it's an overall management system. And this was something that people just really didn't pay much attention to until much later on. And in fact, in 2007, at the 10-year anniversary of the Lean Enterprise Institute, it was a large group of people. I was there as well. And uh, they were solicited for ideas and advice and so forth. And everybody, um, you know, agreed with the suggestion that uh, the terminology should shift from lean production to lean management. So that's how the term lean management came about and popularized. Um, so, but anyway, from the start, it always missed critically important aspects of, uh, of a Toyota production system. And, um, uh, you know, when, when, once this hit the marketplace of, of ideas, managers immediately began to cherry pick the parts that they liked the most and discarded the rest. And so the things that they latched onto were just in time without understanding all of the other things that needs to happen in order for just in time to become reality. Uh, respect for people was not... Uh, there was a lack of awareness of that or it wasn't paid attention to depending upon what decade we're talking about. And this resulted in what I coined the term long time ago, 24 years ago, now lit, fake lean, which was continuous improvement without uh, respect for people. So, you know, the, the principal um, interpreters of, of Toyota production system, which, I mean, let's face it, is the, the globally recognized organizations of the Lean Enterprise Institute and Lean Enterprise Academy. Um, in my view, has always been very slow to understand and communicate the critically important aspects of the Toyota production system. And so this includes, uh, you know, things like Kaizen, which were, was important in the beginning, but fell by the wayside uh, uh, soon thereafter, certainly by the uh, mid to late 1990s. And uh, the respect for people didn't become an item of conversation uh, within the uh, Lean Enterprise Institute. And I pick on them because they helped popularize things um, uh, until 2007, late 2000, December 2007. So, you know, you wonder why after 20 years, uh, the term lean comes to us in 1988, but it isn't until 2007 that respect for people starts to become something that people begin to talk about. Um, so, if, you know, if you have unusual uh, things like that, um, the uh, idea of stable employment, you know, let no layoffs due to Kaizen just, you know, fell into the background, wasn't discussed. The spirit of improvement, you know, the, just the, the, the teamwork, the energy, the spirit of improvement, the challenge to do difficult things, you know, figure out how to increase output with no new machines, no money, no new software, no people, no more space, et cetera. Uh, um, uh, just that, that type of challenge just fell by the wayside as lean transitioned more into the world of just the tools for the uh, manager's toolkit. And that's what it was referred to in the 
late 90s and early 2000s. And the, these days, it's become more like tools for the, uh, the workers' uh, toolkit. Um, what, what also was not really recognized was the evolution in mindset and methods. You know, it's not just use the tools, but your understanding of them evolves. Understanding of the methods evolve. It changes over time. You improve those, those methods and tools and so forth. The idea of uh, infinite possibilities for improvement. You know, you have the equation three plus four equals uh, what? Everybody knows the answer, seven. Uh, but if you take the number seven as a goal and you instead say, you know, how do we get there? Then you have blank plus blank equals seven. What is the goal? So the two blanks are infinite possibilities of how to achieve that goal. Uh, and also the hunger for survival. You know, one of the reasons why TPS was created was to compete against much larger, much better established competitors. They were vertically integrated. They started in the automobile business 30, 30 or more years before Toyota, depending on where you start the clock for Toyota in the late 30s or in the uh, uh, late 40s. Um, and so um, uh, this, was, this was a means for, for surviving in a, in a tough uh, competitive uh, buyer's market for, for automobiles. Um, so my way of looking, oh, the other thing that happened, of course, is, you know, the business of lean became prominent very quickly. And uh, through the business of lean and consultants and, and, and even the way businesses took in lean and how businesses understood it, it soon got reduced to lean tools. This is, is nobody's fault in particular. This happened in the days of scientific management where those methods got reduced to tools and certain Tools were absorbed by companies and others were rejected. Certain principles and, and concepts and ideas were uh, rejected mainly uh, by companies. So we're, we're reliving the past from, uh, from that perspective. Um, and, and, um, and people, of course, make changes to tools without even understanding them. You have 5S, 6S, 7S, 8S, 9S, 10S, 20S. You know, it just goes on and on. Um, lean, unfortunately, to my view, hasn't produced anything, any, any original management innovation other than, uh, you know, of its own, other than the five principles of lean thinking, which are, you know, again, it's five principles of lean thinking, not principles of lean management, uh, not principles of lean production, uh, but it's five principles of lean thinking. You also have the Lean Transformation Framework that the Lean Enterprise Institute, Lean Enterprise Academy has produced. But essentially, all of this stuff has been, uh, you know, appropriated uh, from Toyota. Um, we also know that Lean Transformations are very rare. This was an item of great interest many years ago that you would transform your business from classical management and batch and queue production and the old ways of leading and managing to the new way of leading and managing. And uh, that was a very popular phrase for maybe 20 years. It's fallen away these days. Um, there's not so much interest in that. But where the lean trans so-called lean transformation were successful, they were all led by uh, Shingojitsu or ex-Toyota and some ex-Isuzu um, uh, consultants as well. Um, lean transformation seems to be no longer much of a goal the talk today is, of course, about lean uh, process and product development, which is a, a renaming of 3P, the production preparation process that was uh, created by uh, Ch Chihiro Nakao. So with that, to give you some background, I would like to uh, uh, turn it over to Bruno here to talk about where we are with, uh, with lean today. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, para os meus companheiros aí do Brasil, basicamente o que o Bob passou para a gente aqui foi que o Lean surgiu como uma interpretação né, do sistema Toyota de produção com base na pesquisa aí financiada pelo governo norte-americano que foi executada por pessoas do MIT em parceria com outras universidades e dessa pesquisa resultou aí o termo Lean Production para tentar explicar aquilo que, que a Toyota em especial, né, mas os japoneses no geral estavam fazendo de diferente para ter tanta produtividade é, a mais do que, do que o Ocidente, em especial a América do Norte e Estados Unidos, tá? Aí surgiu o termo Lean Production, mas esse termo deixou várias coisas de fora, por exemplo, a questão do respeito pelas pessoas, 
é, acabou ficando de fora e foi só reconhecido em 2007, sendo que em 88, ali, década de 80, temos aí o, o termo sendo apresentado pelo livro do Taishono, por exemplo. Depois o termo foi tentando ser evoluído aí para Lean Management, né? Gerenciamento Lean, mas seguiu deixando muitas, muitas coisas de fora aí e acabou contribuindo muito pouco, certo? Uh, I'd like to share my screen with you guys, yes. so I can show a, a few facts that I collected about, about Lean. Okay. So I, I, I believe you guys are already seeing my screen, okay? Yep. Well, I selected a few, a few facts about what Lean has become today. Based on uh, uh, based on the Brazilian universe about the subject, so uh, I will show you guys some examples of what we have here in Brazil happening about the subject. But uh, I believe that around the world the situation is uh, very similar, if not the same. Okay. So in Brazil, we can say that lean is still or an adjective sometimes, and or uh, a set of loose things that people apply to to business. And one very recent quote uh, I found on LinkedIn says the following. It was very nice to think about how, connect, how to connect Lean to the quality management system, understanding how they are complementary. But if you guys go to Toyota Global website, you guys will find that uh, Toyota started to talk about uh, quality management systems and they branded as TQC, uh, not TQ, TQM as, as North American, but they, they named it as TQC, started with uh, SQC in 49. It's something from the 50s that is happening at Toyota. But Lean professionals still uh, believe in a necess necessary integration between Lean and quality management systems, like, like if uh, with Lean, this never happened. Uh, I, got another, I got another fact from ASQ website, and they considered that the, the beginning of TQM was in the 50s, when Dr. Deming uh, talked the methods of statistical analysis to Japanese folks. So in the 50s, we already had uh, the beginning of this thing and the integration with TPS that was taking shape. And Toyota never, never planned to have a TPS. They just were trying to survive. And then TPS happened as a trial and error result. And from the book, The Birth of Link, which is a very misleading, misleading title of the book, <laughs> but <laughs> Fujimoto-san, uh, uh, a great Japanese specialist in business, he says that Toyota adopted uh, the TQC. In the same book, he explains that TQC at Toyota was the same as the American TQM, Total Quality Management. And he says that Toyota production system is one and the same with TQC, based on the principles of the zero defects. Uh, and he is very bold to say that they are simply different names for the same basic approach. And if we start to dig a little bit about TPS a little more, you, we, you will notice that uh, the structure is very similar and Toyota kind of upgraded it with some details, very particular details, uh, like just in time and other uh, concepts. So Lean folks and very experienced Brazilian Lean folks are still uncovering how to integrate Lean to quality management but TPS was quality management from the beginning, from the 50s. This one is a little bit atrocious. Uh, this is the marketing, uh, a marketing, a marketing text from a very big online school uh, of business courses here in Brazil. And they are basically saying that Toyota adopted the Lean production in its product, Lean philosophy in its production chain in the 50s and, and <laughs> forward, yeah. <laughs> and they dared to say that uh, it, was it was needed to have qualified Lean Six Sigma professionals inside Toyota to lead this transformation. These folks uh, charges uh, three, three grand in, in, in Brazilian Rio, three grand to teach you Lean Six Sigma. Uh, 
the US but dollars? Three US grand? dollars. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, oh. uh, 500, around okay. 500, a little bit more. But we have a problem with this statement. Ling was created created in 88. Toyota started to, to work uh, at eliminating waste. Uh, uh, in thirties, but strong with a stronger approach in the fifties. Uh, Link Six Sigma was created in the two thousand, basically. So Toyota couldn't even dream about this, couldn't even dream about a, a a belt system, and they definitely wouldn't have some <laughs> qualified Link Six Sigma professionals. Taichi uh would never care about that. And Toyota obviously created Toyota production system, not Link. Lean's American creation. We have also uh, uh, very good examples of how they uh, chopped Toyota production system uh, in, in very small pieces. So one approach that is very popular and people uh, likes very much when, when they see this on LinkedIn is uh, 5S, Lean, Kaizen, and other stuff chop it in little pieces and as steps before getting to Six Sigma. So a very famous and big online course school in Brazil teaches that first you should do 5S, then you go to Kaizen, <laughs> then you can do Lean. So you can follow with Six Sigma and design for Six Sigma. So you got to do step by step. So you can do... Uh, uh, single minute exchange of tie if you are not very good at 5S. Kaizen is something uh, apart from 5S, which is very, very weird. It's a very, very uh, Cartesian view of the things. And th the sequence here is, uh, I can I can believe some folks still, still sell things based on that. And from quality folks uh, in general, sometimes uh, people, people who share knowledge in the network, they also see Lean and Kaizen as an example here, Lean and Kaizen as individual improvement methods. As Kaizen, we can say that is uh, basically the, the seed, the origin, the umbrella of everything we see at TPS. And they split in various things, including PDCA, Six Sigma, total quality management that we already saw uh, a few minutes before that is basically the same as TPS. And here he is, uh, he's apart from Kaizen and from Lin. And Onosan made it very clear in, let me see, yep. 88. Mm -hmm. 88. And that, Companies, yeah, been, yeah, 78 in Japanese. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 78 in Japanese edition. Uh, companies make a big mistake in implementing the Toyota production system thinking that's just a production method. Uh, keep this in mind. In the next slide, we'll talk about something uh, related to that. Uh, the Toyota production system won't work unless it's used as an overall management system. The belief that uh, only a production method is fundamentally wrong. That's exactly what folks are doing here, but uh, in a way worse, way worse uh, approach. And at last, talking a little bit about Lean Institute. Uh, recently, I saw this workshop. It's a workshop about uh, fundamentals of strategic planning, Lean and Agile. But there's something weird, weird here. Agile is inspired by Toyota, as we, as we can see uh, in Scrum. The Scrum folks of Jeff says very clearly that he is inspired, inspired himself uh, with much of Toyota practice especially about Scrum. And we can say about Sprint, a very, very popular concept in, in, in Agile. But wow. Sprint is nothing more than a Jishuken event or the famous Kaizen events from the, from the Americans with another name. We have a target, we have a, a limit time frame, a very short time frame, and we are trying to, uh, to create a faster cycle of delivery of an improvement or in the case of a Sprint, uh, a functionality or uh, a part of a project. And I dig into the uh, the program of this workshop, and I found that Lean Institute is still calling Lean a methodology. And Ono made it clear that 
is not a method or a set of methods, a methodology or production method, but a management system, something that you do uh, uh, overall at your business. And it raised me uh, a few more questions. First, Lean is a methodology. If Toyota production system was a management system, use Lean to teach balances scorecard to Agile is this really progress. Balances, uh, BSC is a very, very old thing. And we need to be to be careful to do a very good integration of it with uh, Lean principles or Toyota production system principles. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of weird uh, trying to integrate it OKR with Hoshin since OKR is inspired by Hoshin. So something uh, that is inspired is not essentially uh, the complete idea of Hoshin being integrated again. Uh, putting both together is is kind of weird. So uh, it seems that uh, Lean is completely lost, not just by us who are uh, not producing Lean itself, but uh, but uh, receiving Lean from the official sources. But the official sources are very very lost too, sadly. You know this is um, uh, Lean has has evolved into a, a grand state of confusion um, this is this is clearly regressive you know and if it's a joke really if it wasn't so if it wasn't real you'd think this is all a joke um, you can see that's just ex tremendous misunderstandings and of course it's a, it's hard to get the details to understand TPS correctly, it's difficult. You have to do a lot of work. It's research and so and experience and hands-on stuff, all of that. But um, but what you see here is really the business of lean uh, taking over and just adding whatever is seems to be popular to gain an audience to sell uh, training courses. And uh, this is partly what makes lean popular because it can be anything that anybody wants it to be. Um, and you know that's the situation that we have uh, today, for better or worse. You see, what the instead of understanding in kaizen, for example, that you do many things at once, such as five S instead of production. You know, you're doing all of these things together. Um, the the people who sell lean have split these things apart into different pieces. So it's a five S uh, training course, it's a kaizen training course, it's a setup reduction training course, and this is all just to monetize lean. And I, I question, you know, is this respect for people? It doesn't seem like it to me. It seems like a lot of uh, disrespect for people. You know, the other thing, too, to say about the MIT study back in the 80s, Ono's books in Japanese were, I think they had uh, Japanese copyright dates. TPS book was 1978. Workplace management was 1980. 82, I think, and just in time for today and tomorrow was, I think, 1984 in the Japanese copyright. Now, the MIT study had Japanese language people as part of the study. Takahiro Fujimoto was one of them. So I don't know if he read those books that were published in Japanese by Ono, where he said these things, it's not just a production system, it's more than that, it's a management system and so forth. Uh, but um, that you know, might have changed the understanding of uh, of what was later presented to the world as lean uh, down the road. Um, I mean, this is a really sad, sad state of affairs of what's happening. And uh, you know, it's it's how do you get how do you correct the bad information, the misleading information, the disinformation that we have now? It's it's out of control, you know. Um, I think Lean has, you know, helped some organizations improve in meaningful ways. But in my firsthand engagement with companies, I don't see much of that. Um, what I see is just today Lean tools for workers, not even for the manager's toolkit anymore. And um, it's it's been absorbed long ago, absorbed into classical management. So there's virtually no lean transformation. It's just tools for solving problems within the world of classical management, no just in time. Um, you know, lean is sitting on its on its ass, waiting for the next Toyota innovation to popularize, you know, to come out so they can popularize it. 
and sell it. I don't know when that will be. <laughs> maybe Toyota's not so interested in sharing it. You know, uh, maybe Toyota's a little bit tired of being uh, <laughs> maybe exploited. You know, um, but we'll see. The sad thing is that uh, the misuse of lean especially without the respect for people component uh i i am i'm kind of structuring my my research project to to submit to to try to have to have uh to be approved in the in the in the in the process of of my master's degree and i'm finding some articles that is relating toyotism and toyotism used as a very pejorative term uh with modern and slavery modern slavery uh because of the misuse because respect for people uh stayed away and it stayed ignored for so long so it's very sad to see something that is completely designed uh designed uh, upon respect for people we can see respect for people in every component of the system uh for example tech time makes the work uh visible so you can see if you are late if you are too uh, way too forward in the the schedule so you can be uh, uh autonomously do the management of your of your your, your workplace and folks are relating it to uh, slavery because we use it and apply it without the fundamental component that is respect for people so this is very sad very very sad it is and if i can give you a little background um so i my first kaizens that i uh were participated in that were led by Shingejitsu was the summer of 1994. And when you participate in Kaizen, you start to learn about TPS. But what is perhaps even more important than that is at, at, at the end of each Kaizen, you know, at 6, 7 p.m., you go out to dinner with the senseis. If you're lucky enough to go to dinner with the senseis, that's where you learn about the Toyota way. They didn't call it that back then because at dinner in the more casual environment and so forth, and you ask questions of the sensei and the interpreter explains different details and so forth. And that's where you learn about things like respect for people. And that's where you learn. I mean, it was clear to me uh, back then, and uh, I ended up writing a paper in 1998 about uh, that was titled lean behaviors about respect for people and so forth. Um, you know that's that's where you learn the um the what's called the tacit knowledge you know what the word the tacit um i don't know bruno what, what it, that that's in brazilian but it's the uh, sort of hidden hidden knowledge and uh and so i took every opportunity i could to go go out to dinner and plus we always went to a good japanese restaurant so the food was fantastic <laughs> but uh but more important than all of that you know was uh, was hearing from them explain the background and the reasoning for TPS and so forth and, and, the, and how, and, and people and the engagement of people and their ideas and creativity and innovation and the spirit of Kaizen and so forth. And that's something I've tried to bring out in my books. Uh, but it, it just is something that has gotten lost in all of this. And so people just focused on the, on the tools. Part of that, part of the problem and the reason why that people focus on the tools is because that's where the marketplace is. You know, if you are, customer first and the customer says i want tools then somebody's going to provide them if not you or or me then somebody else will there will always be a, a trainer or a consultant or somebody who will do that and so this is not anybody's fault but you can see the mess that has been uh, has been created by all of this it's just a very uh, sad situation uh, that we've uh, come to and it's i don't a very yeah, it's kind of a, a system issue. Uh, if you stop to think about, for example, uh, MBA programs, they still teach us classical management. Yeah, and we, we are shaping, we are shaping CEOs in classical management, mm -hmm. and the market will continue to operate in classical management. So it's a very, it's a, we need to dig the root cause a little bit, uh, uh, dig a little bit, a little bit. Uh, deeper to find the root, real root cause for all this this is a systemic problem yeah and if and um ai is being trained as a um helper to ceos in classical management 
I want to share with you a couple of slides here. Um, uh, let's see here. Let me let me get it started. Um, just to give you some a uh, little bit more history here. I think you can see it. Yes. Yes. Okay. So classical management got started a long time ago. Things like blaming people that goes back 5,000 or more years, you know, and when the uh, engineer and the architect built the lousy pyramid, of course, the Pharaoh is going to blame, you know, the engineer and the architect for building a lousy pyramid and so forth. So this stuff has ancient origins and it's rooted in preconception. And in, in, the, in the history of things, you know, you have God and then you have the divine king and, you know, anointed by God as being the ruler and so forth. And so this then begins a process where everything is rooted in preconceptions and you do what the boss says and, and so forth. The boss is the smartest person and all of that. But, but where does, where does, um, where does um, progressive management come from? So if you look at the bottom, the oldest engineering is military engineering, then comes civil engineering, then comes in the 1700s, mechanical engineering. And out of mechanical engineering comes, in some, it was called industrial management in the early days, or industrial administration, even a little bit first, then industrial management. And then comes industrial engineering. And from industrial management and industrial engineering, those ideas come to Toyota. I started in 1950 here, but you can start it in nine, more like 1930s, whatever, but post-World War II period, they take these ideas and improve upon them tremendously and then contribute their own way of thinking and new ideas to create a Toyota management system. And of course, this is rooted in sensory perception. That means you get your hands dirty, you, you experiment, you try it out, you try things out to see what happens and so on. And this is, um, this is your senses, touch, feel, smell, et cetera, your uh, various senses uh, to uh, create this management system based on reality, not the myths associated with preconceptions. And from the Toyota management system, we have this derivative Western interpretation called uh, lean management. And these two things are going, really the image should change to show some kind of, op some kind of different directions, <laughs> probably opposite directions based upon what Bruno showed. Uh, because with Toyota, there's a consistency and a consistent way of thinking. There is also a, an evaluation of new tools and methods. Are they consistent with other Toyota methods would they cause confusion? Would they contradict Toyota methods? Do it cause people to do the wrong things? Is it consistent with the Toyota way? Does it challenge people? Or is it just some more PowerPoint or some more calculation on paper? You know? And if it's that, forget it. Not interested. So really lean and 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 and, and Toyota management system are going in uh, opposite directions these days. Uh, and lean is more in the direction related to preconceptions, which is you need a tool. You know, you always, you got a problem, you need a tool. Got a problem, you need a tool. And that's the way you, you, you operate in business. You got a problem, you need a tool. Um, let's look also at, an, uh, do you have any questions about that? I mean, this is a big, this is a huge, huge difference in thinking in how to lead and manage organizations. Classical management has ancient origins. It has changed over time, but it's still rooted in those ancient origins and preconceptions versus the sensory preconceptions, the understanding of reality, what's the real situation. I'll give you an example. Boeing and their 737 and those crashes. You know, when the, when the engineers go to senior management and say there's a problem with the software, there's a problem with something else, this and that, what does management say? You have to stay on budget. You have to be on schedule, right? Because the preconception is the budget and schedule is the most important thing. The facts that, uh, that are the sensory stuff, the software is no good. There's a problem on the, on the assembly line, et cetera. Forget about that. Not important. 
So this is a big problem. What you know from of your awareness of Toyota, there's a problem on the uh, assembly floor or somewhere in the factory. What happens? The manager comes to see it, right? And they may facilitate in real time the problem solving. Ask why, right? And do it in a respectful way. Don't blame people for the problem. So this is a huge, huge different way of thinking about things. Um, one other slide here. So in 1983, Yasuhiro Mondan, who's Japanese and obviously then speaks Japanese, he's a professor, uh, and he is interacting with Taichiono to write the book Toyota Production System that was published in 1983. And this was another book that was available to the MIT researchers. And in the introduction, this is on page two, something like that, uh, he says, although cost reduction is the system's most important goal, it must, and, and the, uh, why is that? Why is that the system's most important goal? Because you're in a competitive environment. You know, if you, if you, if it was a, a non-competitive seller's market, you wouldn't even bother with TPS, forget it, not a waste of time. But if you're in a competitive buyer's market, cost reduction is always an important thing. And Toyota was playing catch up. To the, to the bigger competitors who had scale, mass production, et cetera. So cost reduction is the most important goal. But you have to achieve other sub goals in order to achieve the cost reduction. And that's quantity control. So the system has to adapt to fluctuations in demand of number and, and type of, of item you're producing. Quality assurance to assure that each process will supply only good units to the subsequent process. And of course, we know in the real world, this is difficult to do and Toyota has recalls and there's problem with parts and so forth. And then respect for humanity, which must be cultivated while the system utilizes human resources to obtain the cost objective. And those human resources are people thinking of ideas to reduce costs. And the Toyota management is saying, um, you're not going to get more money to solve this problem. You're not going to get more equipment. You're not going to get more people and so on. So they're going to constrain the Kaizen teams and the individual people in a way that forces them to think and be creative to solve the problem without needing the kinds of things that their competition will, will need or do. Because the competition of Toyota will say, uh, you know, the manager will say, yeah, okay, here's more money. Okay, yeah, here's more equipment. Okay, yeah, here's more people. Just make the problem go away. And so this is the cultivating of the human resources. And this is why Toyota produces, you know, uh, same number of cars as Volkswagen will have number of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then he goes on to say, these three goals cannot exist independently or be achieved independently without influencing the other or the primary goal of cost reduction. Uh, it is a special feature of the Toyota production system that the primary goal cannot be achieved without realizing the sub goals and vice versa. All goals are output of the same system. Productivity is the ultimate purpose and guiding concept. The Toyota production system strives to realize each of the goals for which it has been designed. So, and, and the words are here are important. Productivity is the ultimate purpose and guiding concept um, and doing it in a way that respects humanity. So it's not improve productivity and lay people off. It's improve productivity and grow the business and continue to cultivate and the human resources. So when you talk to the senseis like Chiro and Nakao, they'll tell you that, you know, you're doing all of these things to improve productivity, but along the way, you improve quality and you improve, you know, the, develop the creativity and so on of people. So where did this show up in Lean? Didn't really show up in the early days. This is really important stuff here. And then in the book, Mondin goes through more details. If you're unfamiliar with the book, you can find it used. I recommend you get it. I think I have one more, just one more slide to show you here. Um, I showed this on LinkedIn a, a couple, uh, I guess it was last year. You know, the principles of lean thinking 
are on the left-hand side. Precise, this is quoting directly from page 10 of the book, Lean Thinking from 1996. Precisely specify value by specific product, identify the value stream for each product, make value flow without interruption, let the customer pull value from the producer and pursue perfection. Um, I look at this in a couple of ways. Number one is, you know, in my Kaizen TPS training with Shingajitsu, they're like, don't think about value. What is value? How do you know it? You don't know it. You shouldn't do this work of Kaizen with that in mind. You should focus on eliminating waste, unevenness, and unreasonableness. Uh, I think this is, to me, is outdated uh, principles of, of, of lean thinking. And you know, if, if we were to continue with the, the name lean and so forth, the principles should be uh, should reflect new thinking, because here we are, you know, more than 25 years later, we need to restate this as mutual respect and trust between management employees, respect your external stakeholders, your suppliers, your customers, your investors, your community, respect the planet, cooperation between labor and management, fact-based thinking and decision-making daily, not just regular problem solving, that's who cares? That's not of, of, of importance or of value these days. It's creative problem solving by rapid cycle trial and error. Sensible, low cost automation where it is needed. Uh, mutually beneficial outcomes among the stakeholders. No layoffs due to process improvement. So ongoing development of human resources. Above average wages and benefits and evolution and mindset and methods. This, of course, is not perfect. Maybe even, you know, it's just to, to contrast um, then to now, but also to, to emphasize, I mean, notice how, how on the left-hand side, it really doesn't talk about trust and respect and productivity. You know, the framing of lean thinking is just not um, what you would have expected had the research been more thorough. Okay, so let me stop the share there. And uh, so for what we have discussed so far, you have questions, comments, Let's, anything in the chat here, not much. Anybody wanna speak up and say anything? Bob, Please. later on, they, they try to rebrand the Lean Thinking to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, purpose, People and processes. Yeah, pe yeah right. people, purpose, and process. That's correct. Yes, yes. Something and like that, that. that started to happen maybe around 2007, eight. I think. I don't recall exactly. But what, but what I said earlier, they've always been very slow to, to recognize or come forward with this new information. Now, yes. maybe they always had this information and they start to dribble it out you know, over time to suit a business purpose. I don't know, but to and... me, it's a, to me, it's astonishing that again, Ono's books were in Japanese. There were Japanese language researchers who could have translated and contribute to it. There is, uh, you know, other Monden's book, a uh, book, uh, Schoenenberger's, uh, Wantuck, Ken Wantuck specifically had several pages in his book about, uh, it was a book about just in time, but there was more to it than that, and specifically about respect for people. This all seems to have been ignored. And from a research perspective, and I've spent basically a lifetime doing research, just started doing research in you know, the age of 20 with uh, other projects, but I mean, serious research at the age of, uh, at, of, of, of 20, 19 or 20. Uh, there is a book uh, from, from Womack. I can't remember the name in English. But in the second edition, I believe, there is uh, an additional chapter where Womack says that when they, are, they were looking for a term to to coin to present uh, Lean as, as a research product or something like that, they knew about uh, other elements like, uh, like the A3 reports and other stuff more related to, to overall management of the system. But yet they deliberately decided to go with lean production. 
but they, they, he said they knew that they shouldn't have used the word production because, uh, in fact, it was a, a management thing. But this book is from the 2000s, and this extra chapter is in the second edition, so it's a, uh, uh, a very late admission of, of, uh, of a deliberate choice. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's just it's just astonishing. And and if you have followed me on LinkedIn and my other work, you can see I'm very rapid at trying to produce the new material as it comes to me and so forth. And uh, you know, not wait until I have a saleable package and so on. And it's just like get it out there. You know, you learn something new, share it. You know, and this is what uh, this is. You know, one of the things you learn from. Uh, Shingejutsu and Kaizen, you know, you learn something new, share it, help others learn, help others improve as fast as you can. Indeed. Don't wait. Um, so, other people have questions or comments? All right, you, what? Oh, yes, somebody had a, have a question or comment? Sorry, I could ask a question. Sergio is speaking here. Hmm. Right, so, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one thing that comes to my attention, not only in this presentation, but also in your post on LinkedIn, you talk a lot about leadership. Uh, but as an engineer, when you are at the university, this is a topic that is not well covered. Mm -hmm. And we feel that as engineers, we are more focused on something that's more time, like you said, you know, parameters like talk time, studying flow, these type of things, but not the human side, especially because it's not part of our, let's say, background. Yes. So... How, how do you see that? I mean, how to incorporate this knowledge to people that are more, they tend to be uh, looking at numbers or flow or this type of thing. And do we need to bring more psychologists or more people from other areas to, 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 to this arena to help us to understand how to, to, better, to be better leaders? Yeah. So you remember the chart I showed that the evolution of progressive management, this was yeah. all... This was all engineering, you know, and starting with in early 1900s with science, late, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, the engineers had ideas for improvement. They would tell the workers, do this, do my idea, make it happen. And of course, the, the workers resent it, you know, and so pretty soon the engineers figure out that you have to go about changing things and improving things in a different way when you're working with other people. And, um, and so the engineers uh, started to figure out that they had to lead differently. And, they would, and, and in scientific management, when they would uh, uh, consult with companies, they would impress upon leaders that you have to change how you lead. Frederick Taylor is famous for saying nine-tenths of the problem is getting management to do their fair share, to, do that, to change how they lead. Only 10% was you know, getting the workers to, to, to join in. Um, and so this problem has always existed and it is the engineering realm who has recognized the need for a different leadership and Toyota, these people who created TPS and who led that effort were all technically trained people. Ono was a technical high school graduate, kind of a hands-on trial and error engineer like Henry Ford was. And then, um, and then, uh, some of the other people were, you know, like Fujio Cho, he graduated from law school, but he, he was uh, Ono's star uh, disciple who became president of Toyota, you know? Uh, and so these people had diverse backgrounds, but they also had technical and engineering backgrounds, many of them, most of them. So the real problem is not the engineers lacking this knowledge, it's, it's everyone else who is uh, trained in the wrong way of thinking through this classical management that you lead based upon preconceptions. I'm your boss, you listen to me. You know, most bosses don't want to hear the crap coming from people below them. Just tell me there's no problems, right? Because problems are bad, that's a preconception. So don't tell me the problem. And then if you do have a problem, come to me with a solution. This is a preconception, I'm the boss. Come to me with the solution for me to approve for you to do it. And this is what everybody hates. But they don't hate it enough to rebel they don't do it i got a job i got a house i got a wife i got a car i got this that the other i need an income what happens if i rebel 
Exactly. I think that they sometimes they don't have the power to rebel, and then they are afraid to to get fired or to get you know, yeah, to be made redundant. Or I I, I don't know if you create this type of uh, uh, rebellion inside the company. Uh, so it all comes to power in your view, like leaders keeping the power, not being able to to transfer these powers to the mid managers or yeah. or operatives on sites. Yeah. I would say that engineers in the world of progressive management have a better understanding of leadership and man and economics uh, and and uh, business, not in the sense of 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 the the financial aspects. By that I mean um, um, going to the market to sell debt, you know, uh, stock offerings, you know, certain. By certain financial aspects we don't understand. Um, uh, sort of the financial engineering stuff we don't understand. But other stuff, we have a much clearer view of the customer and so forth and the, the uh, ideas and methods to make improvements and so on. Um, but, but, you know, we struggle. Here we are 38 years after Lean, 50-something years after TPS, because, uh, you know, this was more or less fully formed. You know, they produced a TPS manual in 1973 for internal, you know, Toyota use. Uh, here we are 100 years, more of 100, you know, 10, uh, 130, 40 years after scientific management, depending on where you start the timeline. But we're still struggling. You know, so. I think things I, are kind of... Let me just say one more quickly. Sergio, I agree with you, though. In, in the engineering curriculum, they don't talk about leadership. But the, the other thing is, in engineering curriculum, would anybody really understand it at that point if you're an undergraduate? No. I think the context is not there for them to understand. They have to graduate, start working in a company, and realize, like my children did, why is everything so messed up here in this company? Why is leadership <laughs> so stupid? You know, And I had to spend a year on and off explaining to them why, the, why there is this ridiculous way of running companies, why it's a ridiculous way of leading. Uh, Bruno, you were going to say something. I believe it's kind of a product, a product of, it, of its time because in the past, we clearly see that folks were more... Uh, uh, learn more about different things. So you, you, have, you have a guy that he's a physician, he's an engineer. So people were more, more complete, uh, were more... Uh, the, the learning approach was more systemic. So... Uh, you are a physicist, you are uh, an engineer, and you're also uh, uh, a philosopher, a poet. You understand of very, uh, a variety of subjects. And uh, then with the vision of labor, the evolution of society, yeah. we started to become very Cartesian. So this is your club. This is my club. I'm an engineer. You are a psychologist. I'm human you are human resources. I'm technical aspect. And in university, in in general, we start we see all the disciplines now, all all the courses in a very segregated way, yep. and we never have uh, 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 a discipline that shows us how to integrate all these things. Why all these things are not uh, uh, isolated components that can do whatever they want, and the result will be the same. We yep. don't have a, we simply don't have a project to integrate everything. Okay. Human resources together with engineering, uh, engineering and with uh, R and D and marketing and sales, and we know, uh, for example, that the cost of a product is very, very much uh, influenced by uh, the project phase, by the design. There's a lot of cost of something that you can change after the design, and we still see all those subjects as separated stuff. Yeah. Yeah, think of this. I mean, because people say, well, we need more change management. We need more psychology. We need more uh, organizational behavior, organizational development. You know, the engineer is very much cause and effect focused, right? And the engineer says, I got a new idea. Hey, you workers, you go do this. Do my idea. And it may take a, a while, but the engineer eventually is going to say, yeah, these workers really don't like me. And uh, this isn't working out. And so I have to, you know, find a different way to work with the workers to make a change happen. And so scientific management benefited from one person 
injecting a little bit of psychology, which was Lillian Gilbreth with her book, Psychology of Management, which in the early days, Toyota people, it's my understanding, were very much aware of Lily and Frank and Lillian Gilbreth's work, but Lillian Gilbreth's work, the psychology of management. But this is very basic. If you read the psychology of management, it's very basic kind of cause and effect thinking of if you do this, here's what here's how people react, here's what happens. But recognize that most scientific management and Toyota production system were both developed with very rudimentary application of psychology. There was no um, change management going on. There was no you know, emotional intelligence. Uh, what um, there was no organizational. Be you know, they weren't looking at Western. To my, to the best of my knowledge, they were not looking at Western literature to figure out how, you know, the psychology to create TPS. And in fact, the book Shingejitsu Kaizen was written but not published. Um, I received the manuscript after kind of begging for it from Shingejitsu, said, let me have a look at it. This is back in 2014. They finally gave it to me reluctantly. I looked at it. I read it. I spent a week editing it, getting rid of 60 pages of stuff, writing stuff in it, bridging different ideas and so forth, and writing it in the way that I learned Kaizen from Shingejitsu. And when I got rid of all the Western psychology, organizational development, organizational behavior stuff and gave it back to them to read, they're like, okay, this is something that you know should be published. Because they don't think that way. And you see on LinkedIn everywhere, um, help me out, Bruno, you know, emotional intelligence, um, uh, I don't know, there's all this yeah, psychology. Neuroscience, neuroscience, neuroscience is very, is very there's, in There's the all this shit out there on, on the psychology of all this stuff. And, uh, you know, just, I shouldn't name names after I said shit, but you know, um, you, you see and it by the way. Like, yeah. By the way, there is a paper that's showing that when you put neuroscience before something, uh, people tend to give more credibility is a, is a fallacy. Yeah. I mean, it's just, there's so much crap out there anyway. So this stuff was developed with just a basic rudimentary cause and effect way of understanding, you know, you train workers, they appreciate being trained so that they can do a better job. They do a better job. Don't blame people for a mistake. You know, basic stuff. So I would say psychology is important on a, on a, on a rudimentary, a fundamental level. But all this stuff you see on LinkedIn and elsewhere that just goes so far beyond this, what has it really done in the world? And I, I have been, a you know, when I worked at, at the company, I have been the recipient of these kinds of trainings and i did get some benefit out of it the first time and so forth but anyway after that it was not much benefit um, so it's important to remember this stuff was created without you know um what's the word without a lot of you know extra thinking of psychology just basic thinking and it's remarkable right it's just remarkable what was created. So if you don't know Lillian Gilbreth's book, The Psychology of Management, you should read it. It's available on Google Books. You can download it for free. Um, you can also, um, there's another book. Um, and by the way, Frank, her husband, Frank Gilbreth, wasn't a writer. So the book's under his name, she wrote. And um, But there's another good book by Frank Gilbreth, written by Lillian, just Oh, it's another one. It's, um, I forgot the name, but it'll have scientific management in the title. Maybe it's principles of scientific management. That's very much worth reading. These are wonderful histories. You'll see the parallels to modern progressive management, TPS mainly, you know, and some lean stuff, but just amazing work that these people that, that Toyota built on and, and added to that great work. Let's talk for a few minutes, I guess, about, um, um, you know, the future. Um, I said earlier that I think, you know, the lean people are sitting on their butts waiting for Toyota to come up with something new so they can sell that and make it popular. Uh, so I think that's the future is another tool, another method, another, you know, like Bruno showed just the diagrams with these things, one through five or the tree with the different 
pieces to it or something. Um, anybody have thoughts on where this goes? Maybe throw in at the wall and see what it sticks. <laughs> Grabbing yeah. a little bit of AI, uh, RPA, and let's see what folks likes better to, to keep postponing what they yeah. really should be doing. You know, Bruno, what you showed from Brazil, uh, the Brazil Lean company there, is very interesting to me because these, the Brazil Lean company and the other ones like it, wherever they are in Poland and elsewhere, these are basically franchises, you know, from the main parent in the U.S. So these are franchises. And so to get the franchise, you have to commit to buying a certain number of training materials, you know, from the mothership. And you have to um, commit, you have to sign a contract that says, you know, 25% of our revenue, I'm picking a number, may not be that, could be higher, could be lower. 25% of your revenue goes to the mothership, right? That's, that's the business deal to make this stuff happen. But what I find interesting is, is these satellite units, satellite business units of the mothership are catering to the local market. Because for example, in the US, yes. They, I don't see Lee, uh, what I see in Brazil there, what you showed. I don't see this crazy conglomeration. It's it's crazy in its own way in the U.S. version, mm -hmm. but it's not crazy in the Brazilian way. The Polish way, the German way, whatever, they're, they're, they're all a little bit different. But it shows you they're catering to the local market and what they think will sell. And so they don't think TPS will sell is the point by whatever name you call it, you know, thinking management system, Toyota management system, Toyota production system. They don't think it'll sell. They think all this other stuff. So plus there is no coherency from the mothership to say that's bullshit. You shouldn't be <laughs> like what Bruno showed. You should say that's bullshit. Don't do that. They're not saying that as long as you can buy X dollars worth of training material and, and send back X dollars per month, per quarter to the mothership, it's good. So it doesn't matter what you sell. It could be crap. But as long as you have a business. So where is customer focus if you sell crap? Where is respect for people? It's Respect for people is not in the business of lean doesn't exist in your company if you have lean or tps or whatever and you have respect that's where it exists right in your company and what you do it is not in the selling of lean doesn't exist i think i think um you know lean is just going to become or has become and will continue to be in the future. It's it's its own thing, you know, drifting further away from, um, you know, further away from TPS and the Toyota way. It's like a genetic mutation. You know, it'll just it's the um, I don't know what the example is, but the the, the thing has turned into something else. Clearly, something else. Clearly yeah. something else. And sometimes they they talk with Toyota folks and uh, offer the offer them positions inside inside the satellite companies and uh, the the motor company. So it could give a little bit more of of uh, of brand to the thing. Uh, but right now they are not doing that with so much intensity as we saw in the past. They are so maybe they are kind of trying to to go their own way, at least in some of the satellites. I don't know if in the mothership, they are kind of uh, brave enough well, to, to separate from- Well, they're not. And, you know, Jim Womack gave a recent um, talk. I did a blog post on this, a recent talk, basically saying that, you know, in the early work, meaning the machine that changed the world and lean thinking, you know, we fully described Toyota's management system from new product development to supplier stuff. And, and they were right. They did. Maybe not in the detail that you or I would like, but they did cover more than just production. 
And, and he said that, you know, and he's frustrated in this talk that, you know, people are not doing that. And of course, what's amazing is, is that he's the founder and the senior advisor to the Lean Enterprise Institute, but apparently is unable to influence the business of Lean to say, you should be, uh, you know, selling what we wrote about as an integrated system of management. And I just found this really odd, which is why I did a blog post on it to, you know, the work covered the right things, but the selling of lean is different. And I'd Maybe be frustrated too if I was, I would, yeah, I would be frustrated too if I was in Jim's shoes. Yeah, there's probably politics and there's probably arguments about, well, that's not going to sell or we tried it and it didn't sell. And so, you know, Kaizen fell off the map for 15 years because they couldn't sell classroom based Kaizen because they didn't know how to facilitate Kaizen on the Genba. So <laughs> they could only sell classroom Kaizen and that didn't sell. So. I really remember about some criticisms from from the enterprise folks about the Shinjutsu uh, Kaizen workshops. Uh, I believe it's from your book, Critique of Lean. I believe yeah. they said something that they didn't want to go that way because uh, because the approach was sometimes very uh, uh, very rough sometimes and folks need something more sophisticated or something like that, more integrated, but they went completely the other way yeah. trying to they target the right stuff, maybe, but with the wrong approach. You know, sometimes you have to yell at people, <laughs> and uh, and that's that's still part of the Shingojutsu repertoire. But uh, these are everybody who's been scolded by Mister Nakao and others will tell you it's been uh, beneficial to them. Um, so the fact of the matter is, is they they couldn't compete with Shingojutsu in terms of Genba Kaizen. You know, so that's what. There's a couple of comments here in the in the uh, the French book club. The French is a book club. I guess the French satellite unit is a book club and an engagement pod. I you know whatever everybody's it's part of these satellite units is doing their own thing. Um, yeah, there's a next question on chat. I guess all the psychology related topics you, uh, you mentioned can be summarized in the respect for people. TPS fundamental. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I'm not sure what Venom and Spider-Man means. <laughs> uh, what What do you think uh, about systems like world-class management uh, or ACE from UTC? So world-class management was just basically another way of characterizing Japanese management system. And this phrase comes from the, the 90s. Um, I believe it was the early, uh, the, um, yes, it would have been the early 90s, maybe even the late 80s, I'm not sure. Um, um, that's okay, you know, where I, f I first learned um, um, Kaizen, we had the world-class manufacturing conference room, <laughs> it was named that. <laughs> um, and in there were the, was the book and other books titled World-Class Manufacturing, there was the book by Suzaki and others. Um, Ace, <clears throat> so uh, I can tell you about Ace because I worked at uh, Pratt & Whitney and at UTC Corporate. Um, so when we engaged Shingojitsu back in 1992, um, Shingojitsu shared with us their Kaizen manual and it was an, it got reformulated into, you know, the Pratt and Whitney Kaizen manual, which described various, you know, described Kaizen and the various methods like, uh, you know, 5S and set of production product quantity analysis. Uh, Yamazumi charts, et cetera. And, um, and three guys in the quality department, there's a chapter of this in, about this in the book, um, Lean is Not Me, that describes what happened. Um, three quality guys some, uh, somehow took it upon themselves to create a derivative version of the Shingojitsu manual that consisted of uh, what were called ACE tools. Um, we can talk about that next time. I'll make a note here. Um, 
ACE tools. ACE stood for Achieving Competitive Excellence. And it, so it was a subset of, of the Kaizen, various Kaizen methods and tools. Um, I have to go back and read the chapter to rec recall why, if, if there was a rationale on why they did that. But it was typical of what happens in a company. You know, Shingejitsu comes in, teaches you how to do stuff. And then other departments look at that. Probably didn't, those guys, I don't know if they ever participated in Kaizen, but let's say they didn't. Then they take the documentation and they translate it for their use to share with other people in the quality organization. And, um, and then you get this reduced version that ends up being just tools for the toolkit. And there was a lot of competition, by the way, about who introduced ACE, because there was Pratt Canada and Pratt US. <laughs> and there's a, there's a peer reviewed academic paper where Pratt Canada has taken a bunch of credit for this and so on when it originated in Pratt US, but whatever, who cares? <laughs> so, um, you know, ACE, what did it do? Um, well, let's just say overall, not much. I mean, what are you, are you trying to achieve? You're trying to achieve flow, right? Continuous flow. Is, is ACE tools going to get you there? No. Makwan, you have your hand raised. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start with thank you for this amazing presentation. Both you and Bruno. Thank you so much. So I have a, I have a question, actually. Uh, you mentioned that the Lean began with uh, respect for people, like in 2006 or seven. I don't remember what you said, but uh, did, did, have you noticed any effects from that focus uh, up until now, or is it the same? I, don't, I think the question is better put to everybody else. I mean, I haven't noticed that it. it's still all about tools and, you know, just, uh, you know, when there's a layoff, who's the first people to get rid of is the lean office and so on. So, you know, it, it, it's not providing the value that the leaders expect. It might be, but the leaders are somehow not seeing it or don't believe it's true or who knows what. I don't know. Other people here, do you see it? Do you see respect for people operative in your businesses? I mean, you know, when you're a leader, you have certain status rights and privileges. And one of those status rights and privileges is to blame people for problems, to get rid of people that you don't like, et cetera. So, you know, in classical management, respect for people is just doesn't exist. I mean, the leaders don't have respect for themselves. Behind the scenes, they're like, oh, so-and-so is really a jerk and, you know, yeah. so-and-so stabbing my back and so forth. And, um you know, so it, it doesn't operate under a, under a, a, a preconception of respect for people. It operates under pre preconception of, you know, watch your ass. You're going to get killed by somebody. <laughs> I'm totally right. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Well, we don't have to spend an hour and a half just because we got an hour and a half. Uh, let me just, I guess, summarize or you know, thank everybody for attending today and take, taking time out of your Saturday. I hope it's been informative. Maybe you learned something. Maybe it changes a little bit your way of thinking about something for the better. Um, and um, what else? I, we, I hope to see you in the next two meetings. And um, you know, have an enjoyable weekend. And Bruno? Closing comments from you. I believe we did very well. We had some some improvement points, like we we talked about yesterday, and uh, I'm very happy of how much we are learning from sharing these things with you guys. Uh, there's a lot of things that comes to our minds, ideas, and I believe we will use very much of what uh, we talked about today for the next meetings. Uh, incorporating uh, pretty much the feedback that you guys will give us and has given us uh, throughout the meeting. So I'm very, yeah. very, very happy to be part of it. And I thank you guys very much for spending the, the beginning of your Saturdays, maybe, uh, with us to talk about something we, we indeed love.
All right. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.